Gone of Dragons, Season 3, Episode 7, Tide of Winter. I not even tall in front of these fellows. What's wrong, Buddha? <laughs> oh, the skeleton scared them. <laughs> Scared big tough Bula. <laughs> Bula ignored the laughter of the crueler of the two kobolds known as Broadflare. They both shared similar short three foot red orange reptilian bodies and wore leather armor common to their kind, but these two were the leaders of their units. Sharptooth was the calmer of the two and less barbaric in nature, and honestly was the better one to talk to. I believe there are boots to lick back. Your camp, little broad flare. Leave. You fat, pompous, ugly troll. You don't tell broad flare what to do. I don't. I. Bula drew a long battered blade from their waist. It was stained dark and had been hammered into a crude shape to serve a hasty purpose. Broadflare suddenly wide-eyed, hoped that purpose didn't involve his throat. He frantically began stepping backwards in the cold mud. Die! <clears throat> Die! Die! Leave! <laughs> Lula watched the kobolds scamper through the mud between the wide makeshift alleys of their tents. The orange glow of fires broke the dark midnight air, dancing off Broadflare's scales as he darted by. The smell of cooking meat of unknown origin was heavy in the low smoke, likely local venison. A mash of beans and a single large ham bone floated as the ladle broke the surface. They gently began circulating it in a false hope to make it taste better. Sharp tooth, Demis Holm. And look, yes, I miss it very much, but we're many miles away now. Me too. I have something I need from you and your team. They grinned knowingly. Lula wasn't a cruel leader of the kobolds under their command. The command passed to them from Dabria when she was made a centurion in Dekion's army and allowed to command a dead legion. They were given the kobolds, a job no one wanted. They were wild and unpredictable. Hordes of teeth, claw, and spear that swarmed the battlefield. A living nightmare. That's what the tall and muscular orc wanted, because they were living. Of course. What is it? She looked at Bula, her dragon-like snout cocked to a side questioningly, her fangs longer than most, and hung over her lower jaw, just slightly, giving her her namesake. Take three with you and make your way south towards home. But I need you to go into the mountains to deliver this to Tubak of the Mystgard tribe. And make your way back to Enruk. Take this coin to show you aren't deserting. Yes, and thank you. At the other end of the camp, Cobalt, Dabria, and Una were discussing the plan for the next day while standing over a body on the hospital bed. The face was unrecognizable behind layers of bloody bandages, but his twisted black beard suddenly shook. I will destroy them. Those puny knights have have insulted me. Shh, my brother. You must rest. So tell me again. Why are you leaving? Dabrian Una stood stoically before Cobalt. She knew a trusted centurion of Decion's undead legions had their secrets and for good reason. But it seemed out of place for this to happen in the middle of a long, major siege. We are being called to the north to investigate the Nether Spring. The Dark Lord wills it. Yes. The great ancient shrine calls us. An artifact of great power. A staff. A staff for my patron. Dabria regarded Una with a hidden concern. According to what Una had explained to her years ago, her patron was a voice inside herself from which she drew power from. Una said that the voice had been there since they were children, over the last ten years or so, as far back as she could remember. A voice that provided some vague guidance, an occasional vision. Dekion could use these powers of Una's to see further, supposedly, using her and dark magic powerful beyond any other necromancers she had witnessed. But 
this voice had become more prominent and clear, it seemed recently, like something had awoken once they arrived. Yes, and we will leave after we launch the first assault of the day. The undead horde will then be yours to command. Just remember, they're not favorable in the sunlight. Obviously. Obviously. Fine. We both know I cannot keep you if the Dark Lord calls you. Leave control of the Horde with Bula when you leave. <laughs> Bula. <laughs> yes. Bula. That is my wish. They can control both. <laughs> you would have them control both? <laughs> It's not as easy as- Need I remind you? Squib put me in charge. And this is my plan. The kobolds and undead will be controlled together. Everyone must step up and do their part. And we don't need to waste resources where it's not needed. When after all, we are this close to victory. Of course. It is your plan, after all. <sighs> I will leave the talisman with Bula when we leave. I will see you on the battlefield tomorrow. Dabria turned to leave the oiled canvas tent, icy air biting against a scarred cheek, her golden eyes narrowing slightly as the corner of her mouth cracked upward, smiling in the darkness. <laughs> He stood on the muddy battlefield and flexed his sinewy strong muscles while squeezing the long handle of the steel great axe. Time and lack of concern for keeping it shaved had given way to a long deep brown shaggy hair and beard that framed his ruddy face and bulbous nose. Hmm. Scottmir looked at the head of the axe, dings and divots told his tale of many successful battles and the survival of many more encounters. Hmm. He looked up and out across the slushy mud of the battlefield. Taking note of their position, he saw that they were the reserves, meaning any charge breaking through and down the center still had to get through several lines of trained knights and soldiers, though the numbers seemed fewer day by day. Uh. Squinting in the morning sun, he turned back to face those behind him. Farmers, mostly he guessed based on their plain ragged clothes and ill-fitting scraps of armor. Many carried a hastily sharpened longsword provided by the quartermaster, but many others carried pitchforks, spears, and other farming tools, now as proud weapons. And proud they were, he marveled. The warriors of his company may sometimes shake, a tremble in their eye from never seeing battle, but they looked forward proudly. They did their best to understand the gruff dwarf's orders and interpret them to efficient actions. He approached a late teens, dwarf, he guessed. Their long black hair hung in locks fastened with clay beads and tied to hang behind them. Deep eyes, red of many years, lived despite their apparent age. Um, hey, what's your name, soldier? Der... Dermid, sir. Where are you from, Dermid? My family holds a small grain field to the east of here. Scottmere perked up. He wasn't sure where he was going to go in this questioning, just that he needed to. It just felt right. There was something he always liked about the generals who walked with their soldiers. And, and now, thankfully, Dermid set up one of his favorite topics. Ooh, what kind of grain? Wheat? Rye? Barley? Wheat, sir. Eh, don't forget that. Wheat, eh? Well, do you bake? Yes. Yes, of course. Quite well today, Dermid. I want some of that bread. <laughs> oh, oh. oh, okay, sir. I said, don't call me that. Got me. Got me, Flintcrow. Get ready to make a tab under that name, buddy, because I'm coming. But well, I need to bring my own ale, on. Well, I don't really. I'll bring the ale, Scottman. My father's next diamond. My family would be proud to have you at our table. Well, then, we need a stew. We raise cattle just to the north of here. Best beef in the land. Fed on cornmeal and blackherd they are. Well, my friends, I'll see you all there. Scott Muir was awestruck. He did it. He actually did it. Where was Benedict right now, he wondered. That he would have been proud. 
A big smile ran across his face as he looked at his brave troops. He turned back to the battlefield, knowing, if nothing else, one goal of the day was to live to see a good hot meal with new friends. The dead moved in a swarm down the battlefield. Limbs ending in crude, rusted and ancient weapons shook with every shambling step. The bodies barely balanced on their ancient leg bones, like the jittery legs of an old spider approaching the end of its days. They drug themselves to certain death, though they knew not the purpose of their re-existence again. Ugh, disgusting. But effective. Right, Lieutenant? Yes. Commander. <laughs> Squib, the crusher. Commander of Lord Palace's forces here at the Celestine Tower had grown impatient to Cobalt's toying with the knights. She moved herself up to watch over the opening assault herself before leaving. They were in control of the battlefield. Soon the knights would fall. There was no need for Squib to waste her own time anymore. Lord Pallas was very clear that the blue dragons would be the ones to assault the blue tower. <laughs> he does excel at matchmaking, doesn't he? She kept looking forward. Her long black braids hung behind her slightly pointed ears. Her red-orange eyes were the color of the fire that burned behind them as she surveyed the battlefield. She smiled slightly, revealing more of the tusk overlapping the top left corner of her plum-colored lips. She flexed a powerful arm under the spiked armor that hung at the shoulder and matching bracers. Her crocodile green skin pulled tight around large muscular biceps. Her eyes narrowed as she sneered slightly, looking up to those on the horses. She hated the use of horses. Well, we will be very excited to see this great plan of yours today. Dabrian Una will be leaving soon. Not that it means much, but I grow tired of your little games. Crush them! You have wasted enough time, and my people grow weary of your games! Yes, my lady. Squib smiled cruelly at the formality and looked at the man at her side. Another orc like herself. His skin was jet black under only a fur war skirt. His massive broad chest was marked in jagged lime-colored tattoos and tribal markings. His eyes held deep rubies. He smiled back at her and nodded. Fine, then. I'll leave you to it. The day is yours to finish your plan. We are done babysitting you. See you back in Enbrook. Do not disappoint me. Let's go, Ebon. Squib turned on a booted heel, her mind elsewhere. As she walked away, her fingernails absently played with the dark brown tattoo of a warhammer emblazoned on her wrist. Dabria watched her walk away her golden eyes lingering too long as she felt the fire of anger in her heart swell. She respects nothing. She's no different than the rest of them. Mindless. <laughs> Rassler has more sense than most here. Squib included. It is time, Dark Sister. She calls us north. Bula! It is time. So how do I use this talisman again? Simply think of the orders themselves and place your palm on the obsidian eye. It really is quite simple. Yes, of course it is. Just, just go. Very well. May their death come on swift wings in your favor, Bula. Caleb's 
mount rode into the right flank meeting with the enemy head on. His shield was emblazoned with the blue crown and sword, and the glint of his longsword darted with precision, rending the undead horde useless before him. I left you some, Keldor! Try to keep up, unless duty still doesn't suit you! <laughs> Duty serves me fine. <laughs> I hit the mud with an impact that shook me through my very being. Dazed, I rolled over to see the tattered ribbons of ancient armor and the skeletal face of the adversary before me. A rusty one-handed axe raised up with a bony claw-like hand. I drug my greatsword out of the mud and at the same time, slicing upward, I stood, leaving them in twain. My mount had cleared from the battlefield, heading back to the keep, as was its instinct, I imagined. I spun in the mud, realizing I was surrounded. Pita. Red orange fire erupted from the ground in great columns of flame toward the sky. Clear a path. A mage in red and gold robes raised her hands sharply as three other mages in blue, green, and violet peeled a hole in the crowd, gathering around me, sending them spinning in a hovering ten-foot orb in the air above me. It flew as if they were feathers in a cold wind. My white eyes looked at myself, surprised it wasn't the same for me. The treacherous orb spinning ominously, made of darkness and sun, engulfing everything. I gathered myself and took the opportunity of running towards them in the clearing. Thank you. Clear out. Duck! Hmm. Sir, get behind us, please. I go behind the tall, bald man in the blue robes. The ground erupted in a wall of ice. It darted across the battlefield in both directions, separating the horde from our army. The knights cheered. The stone monks from the library had arrived to assist in our cause. Our fatigued knights fell back, relinquishing the ground to the hundreds of fresher horses. We saw a blazing spell after spell roll across the battlefield, driving the adversary back towards their lines as they fled. Fenshaw! Searing flames rolling in 20-foot-high, red-orange, arcane wheels of destruction. No. No, this is impossible! Bula, you send them back now! But I... Bula looked at the talisman, but hesitated remembering Dabria's words. They struggled to find the order within their own panic. No! Do it! No! I can't! Uh, Bula was conflicted in their minds, but took the plunge anyways. Slamming their palm over the obsidian stone, they ordered them back. There was a moment of relief there as it was done. As realization poured over their soul like white hot lava. We found they were envisioning their own internalized terror. Their worst fear after seeing the undead legion charging back in flight from the wheels of fire. Their orders were now sending them like a tidal wave deep into their own army. Possible! We watched them flee, Father. It was on that 23rd day of siege when we saw them run. The smell of the blood and death seemed to follow them as we rejoiced in the coming of the librarians from the ivory tower. That evening we celebrated in the dining hall. Granted, we had yet another meal, chicken and vegetables, but this one simply tasted better than any other meal. Even the stale bread trencher seemed to be made from some exotic bread from some far off land. And we even got to enjoy meat together. Mages and knights alike sat and mingled, enjoying ourselves in the hall. We were saying goodbye to some of our new friends. Keldor, Elaviv, and now Corporal Benedict, we wish you a safe journey. Lord Alvar, it was an honor. No, old friend. <laughs> the honor was mine. <clears throat> I believe someone has something they wish to say. Keldor. You, 
You fought well. I am sorry for my words on the wall the other night. I... No, Caleb. You had every right to say them. I, I should have... I paused when I saw the look on his face. He turned immediately away from me and looked at Benedict. I knew he hadn't told him. He didn't want to, as was his right, I suppose. Knowing Caleb, he wasn't sure where to start when greeting the son of his long-dead sister. So he chose to greet him with honor as a knight. It was no matter if I agreed with his method or not. It, it was ultimately his choice, and I chose to honor his wish. I needed to remember that we all carry our demons differently. Sir Benedict, Shieldheart, I wish you success in your journey to reclaim Garnet Keep. I have something for you. Caleb produced a folded black cloth. He opened it, slowly revealing a soldier's tunic, identical to Benedict's own, but in deep red colors, and the single red stripe of a corporal. You will need your own uniform when you succeed. May the knight and maiden watch you now. Sophie, tell me again. Why didn't we go with them? Benedict said this was something he had to do with just themselves. Well, it's a smaller group. It makes sense if they're scouting it out, to be sure. Uh, he said for us to meet them there in a month. Yeah. No one believes there's any threat left at Garnet Keep. Not sure I believe them. I wouldn't. What? The friends looked up to see four veteran knights escorting two prisoners. Mr. Zorin, these two are asking where to find you. We've confiscated their weapons and they didn't give any fight. Well, that one did punch Joey. He was rude. Yes, that's him, my dark sister. His heir. Whoa, 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 whoa. Who are you and whose heir are you? Wait. All right, never mind that. What do you want with me? We need to talk in private about a mutual, well, <laughs> interest. Dabria looked at Una with her gold eyes twinkling sinister in the dim torchlight of the meat hall. Una smiled in return behind her dark robe, pleased in their shared success. Actually, bring your friends. It'll be a party. <laughs> <laughs> Azure is played by Heath Martin. <laughs> Benedict Shieldhard, played by Brian Dowling. Millennial is played by Cheyenne Bramwell. Broad Flair. Red Cobra. Ula is played by Pat Craig. Caleb is played by Ned Donovan. Cobalt is played by Ellie Gossage. Commoner One is played by Valerie Gray. Cordelia Shieldheart is played by Jolene Frescus. Dabria is played by JD Rose. Morin is played by Shannon Roby. Rue is played by David S. D. Sam Weigel from the World Forge Podcast. Shop Tooth is played by Haley Mignon. Sophie is played by Sarah Jenkins. Scott Mir Flint Grug is played by Colton Jansen. Una is played by Becky Atchley. Zorin, played by Cody Miller. Dermot, George Ashford Ditson. Moira Rosewind is played by Lane McCaleb. Lord Alvar is played by Mike Kinker. Ayla Forsyth is played by Elizabeth Riggs. Squib the Crusher, played by Piper Cleveland. And I'm Mike Ashley, your narrator and the voice of Keldor. Thanks to our patrons, Haley Munoz, Daniel Nichols, Jolene Fresquez, Brian Dowling, Colin Holmes, and Corey Fouch. You too can support the show by joining our Patreon. Stay tuned for the next episode where we will take a short intermission and discuss the events around the table and behind the scenes. Until then, remember the oath. <laughs>